Thanks, Greg. Um, so last weekend, I was actually watching Chef's Table, and I started from the very first episode, which featured, in my opinion, an incredible chef called Massimo Bottura. And he actually now has a restaurant, which is a Michelin star restaurant, and they have three stars, and they're really quite impressive. But there was something during that episode that really stuck to me, which was like a single dish. Um, and it's called, Oops, I Dropped the Lemon Tart. And it's kind of exactly what the name suggests. Their sous chef, um, on their last serving, last lemon tart, dropped it on the counter. And you know, this was still before they had like really made it. So they were trying to prove themselves. And the kitchen was in a frenzy. And it was kind of havoc. Um, but I think what I remember was when he described looking at that counter and he found something really beautiful in that dropped lemon tart. And so they replated all of them as broken tarts. And it's now one of the most famous dishes in his restaurant. Um, and I think what I found was is kind of this beautiful way of finding an opportunity in a very difficult, at the time it seems like a really difficult challenge or atmosphere. And it resonated with me because that's essentially what Shellworks always has had to kind of do. We had to find some kind of opportunity or a creative way of getting out of what seemed at the time a really difficult challenge. So Shellworks is on a mission to make plastic waste a thing of the past, one of the big ones. Um, and the way we actually do that is by using polymers that are derived by microbes. And actually, if you caught Fabric Nano's talk, they actually provide a lot of like the building blocks which we could use in the future. But the benefit of kind of working with natural microbes is they have this unique ability to, so similar to how we actually build fat in our bodies as an energy storage mechanism, they have um, an energy storage themselves. And if you extract that, it's a granule in the cell, and if you extract that and you formulate that, you can actually make a thermoplastic and make products just like this jar. Um, but the catch or the benefit of this is that if you throw this jar away, the very same microbes in a soil or marine environment will see it, recognize it as its food essentially, and break it down. So this is the same jar in a home compost eight weeks after we kind of buried it in there. And you know, we kind of hit a big milestone this summer. We sold 100,000 units of this to a customer, um, which felt like, I don't know, this like incredible achievement, but I think, the plastics crisis can be a bit daunting. Uh, and one of the examples that I always come back to is the baby scoop. So a single baby scoop provider will have these scoops in their powder, and they sell 500 million units of it, just one brand. So 100,000 will have a long way to go to get to that 500 million. Um, but I think we find inspiration in sometimes these kind of like overwhelming challenges. So what I thought I would do today is share with you some of the challenges we kind of went through to get to where we are and what the opportunities we found within that challenge. And I guess I'll start in 2019 when we graduated from our masters with this idea from the Royal College of Art and Imperial College of London. Um, and you know, we had an idea, we even had like a few prototypes, but we didn't really feel like we had a proper proof of concept. So we didn't even think of raising investment. We were like, hey, you know what, we're gonna start with uh, grants, we're gonna start with prizes, I'm sure we'll kind of get our way from there, we'll get some cash. And honestly, we were just like not at all successful. We didn't get any money. <laughs> and so we were like, okay, cool, like, uh, chatted to our family and friends and our advisors, and they were like, it's gonna be pretty hard to build a hardware startup without any money. Um, and they reminded of us the fact that like, hey, you need like a workshop and a lab for this kind of thing. You need, like in plastics, you need these like big molds that are made from aluminum and steel, and those cost a lot of money. And you also need to test this in like industrial equipment, and that costs a ton of money. And, Honestly, we were like, ah, oh, great, this is like a challenge we really love. Um, 
But I think there's something beautiful in being like naive and under-resourced and faced with a problem that you just have to be like wildly creative to get out of that. Um, so what we did was, first of all, we moved into my teammate's shed in Wales and we got all of the equipment we could from universities for free and we had our beautiful workshop and lab space. Um, and then the second one was like, we learned how to sand cast uh, and we went to scrapyards actually and we got aluminum, uh, very cheap in a scrapyard, and we melted it down to make all of our molds. Um, and then finally, my co-founder, who probably is one of the most persuasive people I know, and, and to actually, to put it into context, this was all during COVID, so it was not easy to kind of like access anything. And he called like every machine manufacturer in the UK until one of them, actually the largest one, Arberg, was like, yeah, sure, I will put your material in our machine and we'll get you your proof of concept. And so this like tiny disc, that was it. We had injection molded a natural polymer and we had it. So that's when we decided, okay, we're ready. We'll go to investors. We got our pre-seed. We uh, started looking to hire and we were very quickly onto our next challenge. It was like, we made one, let's make a thousand of these and we'll make it for a customer. Which brings us to chapter two, uh, which is the story of the 5,000 perfume caps. I think in this one, this was maybe the most defining challenge Shellworks has had. We, it didn't come from a person or a process or funding or, I mean, even a customer. It felt like a sign from the universe that we shouldn't be doing what we're doing. Um, and to set the scene, basically, we, we had this order from Sana Jardin, they're a fragrance company, and they wanted perfume caps. They were like one of our first supporters. And we were so excited, first of all. And I mean, we still work with them, actually, and they're amazing. Uh, and we'd done like hundreds of prototypes. This is just like one tiny shelf of it. And they were pretty unrefined to start with, but we, we got there, we got to something really quite good, we thought and we were gonna go into production, we had prepared the materials, we had like, you know, our tool ready, we, um, we had a new starter actually coming on Monday, David, and we were like, okay, we wanna come in on the weekend and start some of this production because we wanna have like time when he arrives. So we go back Friday evening, ready to come in on the weekend on Saturday, and Saturday morning I get a call from my landlord at 6.30 a.m. saying, there's been an electrical fault, and there's a fire and you've lost all your equipment. So this was kind of what we walked into on that Saturday morning when we were trying to rush into our production. And I remember speaking to the landlord at the time and he was like, oh, I guess maybe you guys are gonna shut down. And I remember speaking to some of my advisors and they were like, well, maybe you won't be able to do this customer order. And we slept on it. And on Monday, we had David, and we went for a walk around London Fields because we didn't have an office anymore, and we sat down with the sandwich, and we were like, you know what, this might be the best opportunity to learn how to outsource manufacturing. Uh, it's gonna be really hard, we have to do it at some point, we might as well just do it now, and deliver this 5,000 caps. So, essentially, that's what we did. We got these, like, incredibly, chaotic bunny suits, we went in there, we salvaged you know, some of the tool and some of the material and we got it to a contract manufacturer and to be honest, it wasn't easy, like outsourcing was really, really hard. We had a lot of like manual processes but you know, we had a team and like they really pulled us through. And at the end of that, we did deliver like that 5,000 bottle caps and just like four weeks late. The third chapter, and perhaps the final one that I'll kind of share a story around, is our most recent challenge. And it came from this company, we were approached by this company, this is February, called Heckles. They're a skincare company. Um, they're amazing, actually. I, we felt like so much synergy with them. They have a huge like genuine environmental um, mission and 
we were like, yeah, 100%, we're going to work with you. And they had just actually got investment from Estee Lauder. And they were like, OK, so we actually have to do the entire skincare range. And we were like, great, we love more business. Like, let's, let's do it. And when we broke it down, we were like, OK, so they want 100,000 packages. But for us, what that really meant was 300,000 units, because it has like a lid and a base and an insert. And we'd done 5,000, so we were like, yeah, of course, let's do 300,000. Um, and with that bit, you know, we kind of got under control. We found some manufacturers. We learned how to outsource, of course, from last time. So we kind of knew how to get there. But then they were also like, actually, we needed across 13 different artworks. And we'd never really done decoration before, and let alone 13 different decorations for these different formulations that they were going to put in this package. So that was a little bit of a struggle. But we found a printer, and they were like very kind and flexible and small, and we managed to work with them. But maybe the most difficult one was they needed it across five different form factors. And at the time, we'd only developed a rigid material. And what they needed us to do was develop something for their oils and serums, which inherently has a squeezy bulb. And so we were like, OK, great. Like, don't worry. We'll come up with like a different design. And we actually drew inspiration finally from the soy sauce bottle. I don't know if you know, but it has two different sides. And you have to close one side if you want it to pour out a bit slower. And it just works by kind of prohibiting the airflow, and so less uh, drops come out. So that's what we ended up doing. And yeah, we managed to do the entire range, which was packaged in these different items from this into now what exists in their stores, actually on Broadway Market, into our packaging. So that was quite phenomenal. And you know, it's still a work in progress. We're going to probably do another iteration of that dropper, because we actually have a flexible material now. And, we can do something a bit more traditional. Um, but yeah, I guess that brings me to what's next. And to be honest, I don't know. Uh, we have this beautiful kind of workshop now. We rebuilt it all, actually, in the same space. Um, so that's, that's been great. We have also an amazing team. And they're kind of along with us on this journey. And we're trying to scale. I mean, we want to get to that 500 million baby scoops, and we're still at 100,000. So we have a long way to go. And I imagine there'll be a lot of challenges, but I'm excited to see also what kind of opportunities that bring for us. Um, thank you.